Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we will start a, a new topic which uh, given everything that we have been doing so far that is basically we have been looking at uh, one dimensional flow, it will be a little different. It is in some fashion connected to the material that we did right in the beginning of the course when we talked about representation of functions and so on, okay. So, it is I, I want to give you a flavor for uh, variational techniques. Uh, some of you may have encountered these variational techniques in uh, different courses earlier uh, variational principles are used right have been used uh, principles of virtual work and so on you may have seen these before. So there is a, 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 a whole area of study called calculus of variation you happen to take the elective it is good but I think the last time I asked nobody nobody is uh, really dealt with calculus of variations before. So what I will do again uh, in the uh, spirit of this introductory course I will try to give you a flavor for uh, calculus of variations. It is uh, I am not going to do any finite element method as I said in right of the class of techniques I have basically looked at finite difference method I have mentioned hand waved a little on finite volume method, uh, but this is in a sense a foundation for finite element method, okay. In a sense, in a sense it is basically the foundational material for finite element method. So the idea is very simple. What I am going to do is I am going to uh, set up the relevant uh, theorem, the important theorem that we need. So I am going to do it in uh, parts. So in mathematics normally the way we prove something is that we take intermediate steps which are called lemmas and then you prove your theorem based on that lemma, it is a logical sequence. So the other reason why I want to do this is also to give you in case you have not had this before a flavor of uh, proving something, okay. So you may have seen, you may have, you know, so in calculus maybe you have manipulated, performed manipulations and so on, but just so that. At, at a more mature stage again you see right in, uh, these techniques of uh, proving something. So that is basically the driving motive for these set of classes is that fine. So yeah, there are two ways that I could do this one of course I could give you the motivation right up front yeah, or we could go with the lemmas I do not know what uh, I do not know what is the we will we'll try out what the lemma is like and then maybe we can see whether motivation is required I will give you the motivation is that fine okay. So the first lemma this is by the way uh, I am following uh, calculus of variations by Gelfand and Foreman the very readable book you can check it out a library has it. So the first lemma okay basically says uh, if alpha of x is a continuous function on an interval a b. So I would write that as alpha of x belongs to PAB. So this is a shorthand notation right that is the whole point about mathematics that you are learning a language I hope all of you are familiar with this. So CAB is like this big bowl and the bowl contains continuous functions so you can stick your hand in and take out a function right from that bowl am I making sense the AB indicates that it is over the these are it is a bowl of functions defined on the domain AB on the interval AB is that fine. Is that okay, right? This is just matter of notation. So alpha of x belongs to C. So I'm taking an alpha from this, and 
I will have another function h of x which belongs to some more notation. So, I am basically going to be introducing, I am using this opportunity to introduce this kind of notation. So, C0 a b and what I mean by this putting this 0 in between is that h is not only continuous on in the interval, it is defined, it is a function on the interval a b, but it is 0 at the end points. What I mean by this is h of a equals h of b equals 0. The integral of over a b alpha of x h of x dx if it equals 0 for any h normally if you look at Gelfand this statement would come afterwards you basically say if alpha of x belongs to this and the integral a b alpha of x h of x dx equals 0 for any h of x coming from here then alpha of x is identically 0 okay fine. So, if you if so the, the way mathematics works if you are uh, thought about this is basically a conversation between two individuals right or, or all you have to have a split, split personality right. So, essentially what I am saying the statement of this theorem what I am saying is look I will give you an alpha of x the alpha of x will be defined on on the interval a b it will be continuous right. So, I am going to give you a continuous alpha of x such that alpha of x a b integrated this integral will be 0. Now, the other individual you can pick any h of x that you want you pick any h of x that you want which is 0 at the end points and is continuous and I guarantee and I guarantee right that this integral will be 0 fine to which then you say no your alpha must be 0 am I making sense that is a conversation right. So, it is like a discussion I am basically saying look I give you I will I will I will pick an alpha of x I do not tell you what and I am guaranteeing this is 0 and you get to pick the h of x you pick any h of x that you want as long as it is continuous and h a equals h b equals 0 okay right. So, it is like a conversation to which you basically say if you if you tell me that then I insist that you must be picking an alpha it cannot be that oh I have just picked some alpha your alpha has to be 0 that is what you are insisting your alpha has to be 0 is that fine okay. So, the uh, there are lots you know the typically mathematicians will look for different ways by which the, the, the straightforward way would be that uh, you assume that you, you give me the benefit of the doubt you say okay Ramakrishna there is it is possible you can actually find there is we will give you right there is a place there is an there is alpha is not 0 everywhere it is not identically 0 okay alpha is not identical we will go with you let let us see where you go right basically you say I will give you what you want we will get you in trouble that is the idea right. So, alpha of x is not equal to 0 at some at some psi there is some point psi there is some point psi in the interval a b there is some point psi in the interval a b right where alpha is not 0 alpha being a continuous function there is a small neighborhood around that point where it is not 0 basically okay that is the idea there is a small neighborhood where it is not 0 that is why that is why the continuity component is important you would make sure that I use every bit that I have stated here right. So, it is if the function is continuous if the function is continuous you cannot just have the value 1 you cannot just have a non 0 value here and 0 everywhere else that does not make sense right. So, there, there has to be a neighborhood in which it is non 0 and we can assume that without loss of generality as they say that it is positive you can make the same argument assuming that it is negative is that fine okay. So, I finish my part of the story now your part of the story say now you have to get me into trouble. So, your part of the story would be 
okay we need to pick an h we need to pick an h you get to pick the h right see what i am saying is for any h this will is true you have to just pick one h for which it fails that's all that you need to do so your hunt now is to find an h that gets me into trouble is that fine so you pick an h in such a fashion you pick an h in such a fashion that it is zero everywhere and non zero on this interval that's the idea am i making sense okay so you can pick an h so if if this if this happens to be say x1 and that happens to be x2 there is an interval over which it is non zero right so if i pick an h h of x which equals and there are different ways by which we could do this of course we know another way by which we can construct it but anyway i'll just write uh, x minus x1 times x2 minus x i pick pick this cleverly for x and x1 x2 you understand what i'm saying right so i in my mind i said well if the point is in between i want something positive times something else that's positive right so x2 is greater than x if it's in that interval x1 is less than x if it's in that interval so x minus x1 times x2 minus x is positive right that's why i picked that am i making sense and it's zero at the end points x equals x1 it is zero x equals x2 it's equals zero okay we could have used our hat functions also we could have put a small hat function there instead of this but it doesn't matter equals zero otherwise equal zero otherwise so then what if i substitute integral a to b alpha of x h of x dx equals integral x1 to x2 where it's non zero alpha of x h of x dx is not equal to zero violating my guarantee you understand violating my guarantee so which means that i cannot guarantee the only way i can guarantee this is if alpha of x equals 0 identically everywhere is that right fine this lemma is just sort of a warm up to get get your feeling as to where we are going okay uh, i am not going to use this directly but the next lemma we will use directly okay fine questions okay let's try let's try one more see where that goes if alpha of x is in cab same thing and h of x is in now i'm going to change it i'll say c1 ab the superscript 1 indicates now h has also got derivatives okay the superscript 1 now i'm just now i'm not talking about functions that are continuous right the function can be continuous but there may be points where the derivative is not defined okay now i am saying no the derivative is there everywhere this is the bowl of functions which are which can be differentiated everywhere okay this earlier this was a set of functions which were just continuous now we are basically saying no it that's not that that's not it this is a set of functions which is not only continuous but also has derivatives okay it it's just it's just notation that basically tells us see it, it, it you have to get comfortable with it and very quickly it looks like oh it gets messy but if you imagine look at how compact that notation is defined on the interval ab zero at the end points has derivatives you understand right it's continuous derivatives fine okay if alpha of x h prime of x where h prime indicates differentiation with respect to h then what do you expect uh it will turn out that alpha of x is identically a constant okay 
will turn out that alpha of x is identically a constant. Is that fine? Now we have the same we have the same strategy now. We have to we have to figure out a strategy before we start off. Obviously, what you are going to say is we go, we, we have the same discussion, right? It's obvious that I'm saying I'm going to give you a alpha which is come from this bowl of continuous functions. So I'm going to dip my hand in and take out an alpha, and I'll I'll take that alpha and, and I guarantee to you for the alpha that I've got. I take a look at that alpha and say, you know what? For the alpha that I have, this will always be true. You get to choose the h. This will always be true. To which again your response will be, if that is a fact, then your alpha must be a constant. Okay, right? And again we go through the same argument, saying, well, okay, maybe my alpha is not a constant, right? You give me the benefit of the doubt one more time, and say, okay, alpha is not a constant. Alpha is a function of x. So if alpha varies, if alpha varies, your your business now is to give me an h that will get me into trouble, right? So that it will force me to concede that alpha is a constant. Am I making sense? Okay, is that fine? So our objective is now to construct an h. Further, not only construct an h, h which has a derivative. We need to construct an h which has a derivative with what we have in in our hands what we have available to us we need to construct an h which has derivatives okay so it's a good idea to define h as the integral of something see it already give you see the, there is a there, there there is a logic that pushes us okay so these are these are standard tools that you would use when you are looking for something there is one there is inspiration you it strikes you saying oh i see the i see the proof the other is that you sit down and you actually work through systematically so these are clues that you get these are clues that you have so it has to equal a constant so we'll start by defining a constant as the average of the alpha okay and i do that the average value of the alpha right then if i say alpha is you understand what i'm saying alpha is a constant it will be the average value obviously so the average value of alpha uh, i've called that i'll say constant i'll define c as what is the average value integral a to b alpha of x dx 1 divided by b minus a that's the average value we'll start there we'll start with that constant okay so if your alpha is identically so what i want all we have now come to is i have to prove that alpha is identically that constant fine so this can be rewritten actually this is b minus a times c b minus a times c which suspiciously looks like integral c dx between a to b okay so b minus a times c so this looks like integral c dx a to b right which i take over to the other side the average in a sense you can, i mean you may have seen this normally people will just do it directly so you say the average and we put a semicolon there so alpha of x so i define a c in that fashion that's just the average it's the same thing i just manipulated it started off the average multiplied by b minus a recognize that that's the integral the average that's essentially what it means right the integral of the function and the integral of the average are the same and that's essentially what we are saying the integral of the function and the integral of the average are the same fine right so i said oh i need an h that's differentiable i have an integral right so i can define an h now so i say h of x okay so what is h of a 0 what is h of b 0 and the derivative exists you understand what i'm saying so we've got we've got we've got what we want is that fine
Now what? Now I have to somehow involve this in that I have to involve this in this integral. I have to get an integral of this form, right? I have I have this, I have to somehow get an integral of that form. So I say okay, let me look at into h prime dx okay which is nothing but integral Okay, so this is zero because this is h h b minus h a. This is just h b minus h a. C times h b minus h a. That's zero. This is what we want. And what is this? This I'm guaranteeing to be zero. This is what I claim is zero. I have given this to you, I said oh you pick any h, I guarantee this will be 0, right. So this is 0, fine that is a given, that is 0, that is my guarantee. And what is this? What is h prime? Alpha minus c. So now I have integral a to b alpha minus c whole square, I write alpha of x minus c whole square dx equals 0 and this is a positive quantity. The integral of this positive quantity is 0 therefore the thing itself has to be 0, you have no choice. Integrand, the integrand is positive, is greater than or equal to 0. Alpha of x minus c squared is greater than or equal to 0. This tells us that that is possible since this right hand side equals 0, alpha of x has to be a constant, has to be that particular constant, is that fine? So it is not bad, I mean you can, we can work through, we can work through and the all, always when you are reading these theorems you should always look at it as a conversation, right, at least it helps me, I do not know whether it helps you, but it always helps me, right, to look at it as a conversation. Okay, now let us see if we can get to the third lemma, lemma 3, before we get to the actual theorem okay the third lemma says i have two functions now if alpha of x and beta of x belong to cab there are two functions that i have alpha of x and beta of x that come from cab right so and h of x again maybe i need to erase this belongs to cab which is zero at the end points first derivative exists the integral a to b alpha of x h of x plus beta of x h prime of x dx equals 0 okay so this is a neat relationship then this says remember that i i have picked alpha and beta from the bowl of continuous functions. If this is 0, right, then you can assert, you can tell me, look, you must have picked beta which has actually got a derivative and that derivative is alpha. H 
if I guarantee this, if I guarantee this, then you can tell me you must have picked a beta that has a derivative, right and that derivative is alpha, okay, is that fine? So again we look here, we look for clues just like we did last time, uh, clearly, clearly we will have to figure out something to do with this integral, now it has h and h prime, so we either have to convert it to something that has h or something that has h prime, we have done, we have done a lemma before which had an h prime, right, we had done a lemma before, way before that we had which had an h. So if you could somehow convert this to something that is completely h prime or something that is completely h, we could apply one of the two previous lemmas, okay that is one thing that is clear, okay. am I making sense? See this is strange, the first one had only h in it, the second one had h prime in it, this has both, okay. So I am thinking well yeah if I want to convert this to an h prime, I know one rule that will get me introduce a derivative when we are doing integration, integration by parts we have products of things right, so I know one rule by which we can get, I know one, one mechanism by which we can do it, integration by parts will get me a derivative, see we are working out strategy now right, so integration by parts will give me a derivative, so that is fine, okay. The second thing is I want beta prime to be alpha, so it looks like I need the integral of alpha in some fashion, so we start by defining a function which is the integral of alpha, so a of x is the integral a to x alpha of x dx, okay. So that is a potential candidate for beta. You see what I am saying? So I have no because I look at this and I say okay let us let us get the let us lay the foundation first, right. So we have that. Then what? What do we do? integration by parts, so we start with alpha of x, h of x, so the integral a to b alpha of x, h of x dx equals the integral, how should I do this, a to x, the integral that is a of x. h of x between the limits a to b, actually I want that but you know you understand what I am saying, I basically want uh, and minus the integral a of x h prime of x dx. that is not bad, right, that is not bad, we can just go back now and substitute for alpha of x, h of x, I can just make this an indefinite integral if you want but anyway it is okay, I leave it as it is, since I have written it I leave it, And therefore we apply lemma 2, you understand, I have some function of x times h prime of x dx equals 0 and our second lemma basically said this quantity must be a constant, okay, am I making sense? See that is the idea of that is why you do these lemmas are small, small results along the way they are like they are the programming equivalent of writing small functions that you can use to build the reach the bigger objective, okay, that is the idea. So this tells me that beta of x minus a of x equals a constant or beta of x is if I differentiate beta prime of x is alpha of x. Okay, 
that is that is three three lemmas. This belongs to as I said the segment of the course that I call three lemmas in the theorem. So we have done the three lemmas. What about the theorem? For the theorem, I'll give you a motivation, right? Why have we done all of this? Stuff? What's the point? Okay. So we had said in the beginning, as I said, I'll tie this up to the material we have what we have talked about at the beginning of this semester. As we said in the beginning, what we are looking at is functions, the solutions that we are looking at, right, are functions. The problems that we have at hand, the solutions that uh, we seek are all functions. A simple example now would be you are at your dining hall or whatever having breakfast this morning. You wanted to come to this class. There are any number of paths that you can take. There are any number of paths that you can take from your dining hall to the class. Am I say making sense? And each one of those paths is a function of, in this case, x, y, z. Right? Since we are on the third floor, in this case, x, y, z. Right? So you start off, you you walk along, or you bike along, but we'll assume that you walked along. You walk, for, so you start walking. And there are different ways by which you can get here. Okay. Some of you may forget, make a turn. Uh, near chemistry building and head out, head out in the wrong direction and then maybe come through humanities and sciences block and come here. So it is a long winded path, right. So you have the question that we have now, so, uh, nice, so there are lots of paths, right. It is nice to know that there are lots of paths. So one block, block path is blocked, you can come by another path. So but the question that we ask now, right, which makes this interesting is, is there a shortest path? Is there a safest path, right? Is there a most energy efficient path? Summer is coming. Is there a path that is the coolest path? So you have a metric, you have a measure to say to 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 like this is like a residue to say that yes, I have what I want. Okay, so you can ask this question. So there is an issue of optimality here. What is the optimal path? What is the best path in some sense? Okay, so if you say that you have the best, what is what do you do normally in calculus? If you say I have the maximum or minimum, what is it that we normally do? No, no. Before you get to the derivative, derivative comes later. We'll go towards something that looks like the derivative. Derivative comes later. Changes you perturb it, you disturb it. So if you think that you have a minimum, you disturb it, and the disturbance should cause the the value of whatever that you the function that the the measure that you are looking at to increase. Am I making sense? So if you say I am looking for the shortest path, if you disturb the path, if you disturb the path, then the length should increase. It should no, no longer, it should be longer than the shortest path. Any other path should be longer than the shortest path. So the length should increase. Does that make sense? Okay. But clearly you always want to start whatever the disturbance that you do, you always want to start at the dining hall and end up in this classroom. If you create a disturbance that takes you from the dining hall and takes you to a wrong to the wrong classroom, that does not help, right. So that explains why h of a equals h of b equals 0, h is the disturbance, right. To, to explain why, why is this function, what is this peculiar function that I am talking about, where I keep saying the endpoints are 0 and it is a continuous function. It is continuous, yeah, you are not going to teleport from one point to another point. You are not going to, it would be nice, but you are not going to sort of walk along and suddenly zap and then you appear at some other point, right. There is no discontinuity. <laughs> the path is a continuous path, okay. So the path is a continuous path. So you are going to start at one point, always end up at uh, the other point. These points are the same. You can change the path, but the end points do not change, okay. So what you do is you have h of a equals h of b equals 0, a is the starting path, b is the ending path, am I making sense? And you have continuous functions and you can perturb with this h, that is the idea, okay, fine. So in calculus of variations, the usual way by which we do this, maybe I will leave that there. So we look at I might as well use the standard notation calculus of variations. Functional
it is a function, it is argument is a function, I am going to give you a path, a whole path, you understand the argument is a function. So this thing is a function of a function, right, so it is a functional equals the integral a to b f of x comma y comma y prime dx where as earlier y prime is dy dx obviously y is a function of x fine. What we want is we want j of y, we want that y, we want to find a function y so that j of y is a minimum, is an extremum or a maximum, right. This could be some function j of y could be your profits, you want to maximize your profit, right. This could be some function, it could be the distance between two points and j of y is the distance, measure of the distance, you want to minimize the distance or it is the time right or you want to maximize this is a function it is the it measures the it gives you j of y is the amount of time that an airplane flies you want to maximize it to get endurance then y is the function that will tell you what is the long, longest maximize that time. you understand you can these are all these are all basically they take a function as an argument and it returns a number it returns a number it is a map it maps a function given a function it maps the function into a number you understand what i'm saying so if our if our function y so is y prime there's a derivative if our function happens to come from c1 defined on ab it maps it to the real line am i making sense that's what this is doing it's taking a function and giving you a number just like a norm did that's what our norm did norm of the function that's what it did the norm of the function basically swallowed a function and it spit out a, a number, the same thing, okay. That is what our norm did. So it is not, it's not, it's not very different from something that we have seen before, okay. So we want to take derivatives, we think back derivatives, the, the perturbed, we perturb it j of y plus h. What is h? h is our earlier friend h, 0 at the end points you understand and continuous a to b f of x y plus h y prime plus h prime dx okay and just like we do when we define a derivative i subtract this from this i subtract that so I get j of y plus h minus j of y is the integral a to b f of dx. So far so good. What can I do now? Left hand side there is nothing much we want, we want to find that out, right hand side is the only thing, there is not anything that we can do here. So we look at this Taylor series, you, you look at this and you think tail Taylor series, right. Since I am thinking in terms of derivatives, since I am thinking, do not ignore the fact that we are talking about functions, ignore the fact that this is a map from functions to a real number right now. Since we are thinking about derivatives, since we are thinking about derivatives, what is the derivative, what is the general, uh, def, general sort of symptom or definition that I gave for a derivative, it is a linear transformation in the direction. We know the direction, I have perturbed it in the direction of h. We want the linear transformation corresponding to that, getting out of that, right. We want to get the linear transformation not corresponding to that but getting out of that. So we have the difference, we want to, we want, so what it basically means is I am going to expand this using Taylor series and keep only the linear term, right keep it only till linear because that is what I want, I want a linear transformation. So do I have integral a to b f of x y 
y prime plus what is the second term of Taylor series h times f of do f do x do f do y plus h prime times do f do y prime minus is that fine? Right, so then this would be h times dou f dou y z delta z times you understand what I am saying dou f dou z that is it this is a Taylor series right and I have chopped it off at the linear term this of course cancels giving me the integral a to b h dou f dou y plus h prime dou f dou y prime dx since it is a linear part we call it the first variation it is given the symbol delta j called the first variation called the first variation it is a change it is the first variation like they sound like first derivative like the first variation and if it is an extremum this variation will be 0 if it is an extremum this variation will be 0 fine if it is an extremum the variation will be 0. Now we are ready to apply lemma 3. Lemma 3 basically says that if you have alpha of x h of x plus beta of x h prime of x dx equals 0, it is 0 for any h that you give, right? Any perturbation that you give, then beta prime of x equals alpha of x, that is beta prime is d by dx dou f dou y prime equals dou f dou y is that fine everyone. These equations are called, you may have seen this maybe in your physics or something of that sort, Euler Lagrange equations, Euler Lagrange. Okay. Fine. In your uh, physics, most probably you heard, heard heard about it as the Lagrange equations. You have to define the Lagrangian and so on, right? So that comes from the analytic dynamics point of view. But uh, yeah, so they are called the Euler-Lagrange equations. Is that fine? Are there any questions? So we have managed. We have managed. This is an interesting thing that's happened here. So this is this is a this is a differential equation, right? In some sense, this is like a derivative. So we have managed basically. To go from an integral variational form, right? Integral variational form, which was where, which was here, 
we want to manage to go from an integral variational form j of y which we want to minimize or maximize or get the extrema right get either the maxima or minima we manage to go from this form through this process to a differential equation. So we have gone from something that looks like something that looks so this is like differentiating differentiating it in some fashion like taking a derivative and setting it equal to 0 that is basically what we have done we wanted an extremum for that functional we wanted an extremum for that functional and we have managed by some process of differentiation to get a differential equation is that okay everyone is that fine of course there is the equivalent you could ask the question if I give the differential equation can I go back to the variational form okay and just like differentiation and integration going from there to here is easier than going from here back there right because now you have to guess you have to come up with a variational problem and then turn around and say if I take the first variation of that do I get do I get the equation that I have at hand so the integration the it is like the, the equivalent of the integration form again involves guessing right so the direct thing going from the variational problem the optimization problem to here is relatively easy fine is relatively straightforward very often there are times when you can ask the question why would you want to go from here to there there are times when this is very messy and the variational form looks is quite simple and elegant okay and maybe I will give you an example of that a little later let me see if we can I will just set this up we will see how far we can take this today so what is the example that we talked about we talked about uh, distance between two points right so I will, I will take the distance between two points a and b that is a that is b this is the x axis I do not write a and b there right and what we want is we want y equals y of x such that such that length of the path I should not say distance between two points length of the path is shortest. the length of the path is shortest okay the shortest path then you could identify as the distance between two points and I have actually changed though I gave the example as from your dining hall to here I in a subtle way change the problem how I change the problem there are no obstacles here this is truly the straight line there are no buildings in between there's no, there's no you can't there are no obstacles this is this is you can just walk the straight line path which is what you should get right you can just walk the path am I making sense so what is the length of this path y of x what is the length of this path what is j of y what is integral a to b remember square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx okay it is the, it's the square root of ds squared ds is ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared and finally write it this way And f happens to be capital F happens to be okay. What is do f do y? Zero. Fine. What is do f do y prime? y prime by square root of 1 plus y prime square oops y prime by right the 2 and a half cancel so the Euler Lagrange equation tells us that 
do f do y is 0 Euler Lagrange equation tells us that d by dx of y prime by square root of 1 plus y prime square is 0 or y prime divided by square root of 1 plus y prime square is a constant I just say c. There are different ways we could do this but anyway we will we can we could start from here integrating appropriately or we can do indefinite integrals and then can we solve for y prime y prime squared equals c times 1 plus y prime squared. Therefore, you have to always be careful when you square things. So you allow for spurious roots. Therefore, y prime is or y prime squared. If you want, if you want me to keep it simple. Y prime squared is c divided by one minus c. Okay. The other thing that you can do is the other thing that you can do is you can integrate this between a to x, right? And see, you can integrate this between a to x, then you will get a lower limit which is this quantity at a, and then you can manipulate if you feel more comfortable doing that. So this tells you basically y prime is a constant. This basically tells you y prime is a constant. Or y equals y of x is a straight line y of x is a straight line is that fine okay right thank you